Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Hyland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The man who just fell down the stairs is Colonel James Fisk, Jr. Although the colonel is a man given to the consumption of dozens of Blue Point oysters and bottles of heady wine at a sitting, his friends were given to pointing him out as a man inordinately steady on his feet. So why did he tumble down the stairs, and in New York's Grand Central Hotel, no less, where stair tumbling was frowned upon? The colonel didn't slip. He wasn't pushed. He was shot. The sudden presence of two bullets in him had upset his equilibrium. The man who's running away is the man who just shot the colonel. His name, Edward S. Stokes. Until recently, the colonel's very dear friend. There he goes. And tonight, my report to you on the checkered life and sudden death of Colonel James Fisk, Jr. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Hyland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. And now once again, Thomas Hyland. <laughs> Colonel Fisk lay at the bottom of the stairs... A few minutes before four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, January the 6th, 1872. He was dying. His life was coming to an end. And he would be sorely missed by his family, Mrs. Fisk and the children, and whom were Jay Gould, Boss Tweed, and the heavier stockholders of the day. A man dying, and I know the precise instant when his dying began. It started some months ago in a rather ornate house in Washington Square. Two women were talking, and the younger one said, Annie, how can I meet Colonel Fisk? That was the instant. And the older one said, <laughs> But the younger one was not young enough to take Deary for an answer. I mean it, Annie. I want to meet him. He's so wealthy, isn't he? And all I have is a black and white silk dress and an empty purse. So very empty, dear Annie. Oh, orphans in the rain and empty purses sadden me so, dear Josie. And I've heard he's coming here tonight to visit with you. The dear Colonel says I set such a good table. Uh, dear Josie. Yes? Walk over there to that cabinet, dear Josie. In the very bottom drawer, you will find two candlesticks given to me by the minister from Egypt. Get them. Yes, now put them on the table. Mm -hmm. And light them. Good. Now blow them out, gently. Well, Annie? Dear Josie, will you join the dear Colonel and me for dinner tonight? So nice of you to ask. I'd be delighted, dear Annie. <laughs> So it was that Colonel Fisk and Josie Mansfield met. I kiss your hand, Josie. You're a very sweet man. <laughs> Isn't she a dear? So lovely. And so poor. So sad. The Colonel was a man easily touched. And this was the era for young widows, beautiful and penniless. It was the era for weeping at the mere thought of such a situation. It was a decade of compassion and champagne. And this night, the meeting night, was one of the most poignant of the decade. Tomorrow, Josie, a jewel to lie against the throat. Oh, Colonel. My carriage will call for you at noon and bring you to me. The necklace counter? Of course, my dear. More wine. <laughs> Look, 
at it, dear. Do you like it? It's very nice. Ain't it all yours? Oh, thank you. I've always wanted a home of my own. And servants of my own. Six. Kiss me, Colonel. Good evening, Colonel. Evening, Quimby. This is Mr. Stokes. May I take your cane, sir? Thank you, Quimby. This is in the drawing room. She's waiting for you. This way, Stokes. Hello, Colonel. And you must be the Colonel's best friend, Mr. Stokes. I hope this is no imposition, ma'am. Preparing dinner? Certainly not. I just sat here all day, listening to the new present the Colonel sent me. While the servants made ready. Do you like the new music box, my dear? It reminds me of you when you're away from me. <laughs> Such a pretty speech. How fortunate you are, Colonel. Oh, wait till you taste her pheasant a la Esther. I can hardly wait. Uh, Excuse me for a moment. Where are you going, Colonel? I left a small package for you out in the carriage, my dear. And oh, of I... course. We'll excuse you. So, you're Mr. Stokes. I must say he was right. You are elegant. He was right. You are very lovely. And you... You're... What? You are. Will you help me light the candles? Josie. Will you help me with the fireplace? Josie. The music box is run down. Will you... Josie. You won't help me with anything. You're wicked. You're very wicked. Mr. Edward Stokes was five feet nine inches high. His head was covered with glossy curls, his complexion clear, his features regular, and his eyes dark blue. He was dressed in the height of fashion, and his diamond studs gleamed brilliantly. And after the colonel returned with a forgotten package... Oh, a ruby pendant. Thank you, colonel. You're very welcome. And after the wine was drunk and venison devoured, and the fingers dipped in the lemon water, after that evening of old friends and new, after that, there was a new day. And there was this. Good morning, Mr. Stokes. Good morning, Quimby. Is, um... The mistress is in the sitting room. She's waiting for you. Thank you, my man. Josie. Edward. Oh, wait, Edward. I was out this morning early shopping. Here, I bought something for you. Open it. Josie. Oh, stick pin. There was no need for you to... Oh, yes, there was. Now be quiet. Wild, storm-tossed lovers you might care to eavesdrop upon, since they'll give you a better understanding of the currents sweeping these two upon violent shores, like this one. The best champagne in New York. Now take off your little shoe. <laughs> Here, use my mallet, dear. <laughs> this croquet has brought the pink to your cheeks. Make your shot. <laughs> As is always the case in skullduggery of this sort, there is an... In the meanwhile... In the Park Avenue home of Colonel James Fisk, Jr., 
the colonel and his lady. The children have been tucked away for the night, the servants snug in their quarters, as were the animals. A quiet hour, an hour for a man for family discussion. You fool! You cheat! Blackguard! Uh, Dear, the children, you'll awaken them. A woman like that? Have you no compassion in your heart? She's a widow. Ha, ha. Alone in the world. I, I am but her advisor. Ha, ha. Now that's all you are. What are you talking about? What all of New York is saying. And that is? Ha, ha. And that is? The most concerned is the last to know. Know what? Your precious widow and Edward Stokes. What? Ha, ha, Colonel. Now you know what I've been through. The aggravation, the shame, the heartache, the sorrow, the unrequited love. Where is uh, the uh, mistress? Is in her boudoir. Go awaken her. Who is it, Quimby? It's not Mr. Stokes, ma'am. Why, why, good evening, Colonel. What's this I hear about you and that... that scamp, Edward Stokes? Why, what have you heard? That you and he... Who told you that? My wife. The Colonel. Then it's true. I love him very much. Josie. Go back to your wife. I warn you. You warn me. You, Colonel? Listen to me. I'll ruin you. Please. Go home. You and Edward Stokes. Mark my word. I'll ruin the both of you. My promise to you, if it takes the rest of my life. The Colonel left. The Colonel was driven to his club where the Colonel spent the night. And the next morning, early, the colonel began the final week of his life. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. A dead man's coat is the key to a killing. Its disappearance starts Mr. and Mrs. North off on a merry, mysterious manhunt tomorrow night. Don't miss Coat of Arms, a matter of murder confronting Pam and Jerry North. Tomorrow, listen to For John Lund is yours truly, Johnny Dollar, the insurance sleuth with the action-packed expense account. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the checkered life and sudden death of Colonel James Fisk. Junior. I'd like to set the coordinates for you again. Take a reading of exactly where we are in time. The year is 1872. The place is New York City. Now, 1872 was a vintage year for pearls in the bottom of champagne glasses, of fatted railroad stocks, and the diamond harvest was spectacular. The term rags to riches was coined on a day in this year, when a raggedy sewing machine girl was summoned from her chores, taken by the hand, dressed in silk, then released into a gilded cage. New York City at this time was a center for many similar dramas one of which we're concerning ourselves with. Colonel James Fisk, Jr. had compassion for a widow named Josie Mansfield. Josie Mansfield had compassion for the colonel's friend, Edward Stokes. The colonel, upon hearing of this arrangement, immediately went into action in a colonel-like manner. Your Honor, I want to swear out a warrant for the arrest of Edward S. Stokes for embezzlement. Why, certainly, Colonel. We'll have the culprit in jail in no time at all. 